So I'm currently working on this website called Tutab.io, which will be a, a search engine for programming tutorials. So the idea is that people can submit links to programming resources like video tutorials, full courses, books, blog posts, whatever, together with some metadata, what format it is, text or video, what the difficulty level is, what topics the resource covers and so on. And then we have this list of resources and people can up and downboard these different tutorials and courses. And the goal is that you are, can always find the best resource, the best tutorial or course paid or free on any given topic. And the same as in my last project, Engage A Lot, I'm using the MERN stack here. MERN means um, MongoDB as the database, Express for the server, React for the front end, and Node for the server as well. So Node and Express, they basically work together. And for the MongoDB database, I'm using Mongo Atlas, which is basically MongoDB's cloud service. So instead of storing the database locally on my server, it's stored on their servers, similarly to Firebase, which makes it easier to scale because you don't have to care about where the data is stored and how it's stored and how to add additional uh, storage and so on. That's all handled by Atlas. And I'm really happy that I picked MongoDB and particularly Atlas because they have a really nice full text search functionality. And of course, for a project like Tutab, it's really important that the search works properly because yeah, that's the whole idea. That's the whole idea of the project. It's very reliant on search. And in this video, I want to give you a little update on uh, the project, how it looks right now. And I want to talk about search and how I implemented it a bit more specifically because I think it's really interesting. Okay, so of course we are still on localhost here. The website is not online yet, but I can already show you how this looks. So for the first version, I want to keep it as simple as possible. Minimum viable product style, only implement the absolutely necessary features, then release it and then iterate from there. So right now on the front page, we have this search bar here and I can type something in, for example, Android beginner tutorial and hit search. And this will search in the database. And as you can already see, it's super fast. Now, my first idea was to just take the search query and search for this exact string in the title and in the text of the resource. But of course, this wouldn't work properly because this exact string might not appear anywhere in the metadata of the resource. Here you can see an example. We are searching for Android beginner tutorial. This resource is called Android course for beginners. This is basically exactly what we are looking for, but the phrasing is much different. It doesn't have tutorial anywhere in its title. The words are aligned differently. So beginner is here in the middle and here at the end. Also, this has the word beginners, not beginner. And we have to pay attention to a lot of these small things to actually find the correct resources, even if the, the name is different and the phrasing is different. Instead, as I already explained, I'm using Mongo Atlas search and specifically I'm searching for each word individually. And then Mongo Atlas applies a search score for each result. And we order these results by the search score. And the score is what you can see down here. Now I only show this for debugging purposes. Of course, this number here will not be visible on the final website when it's online. It's just for me to see what the score for each result is and if it makes sense. So let's actually take a look at the server code and see how I've set this up here. So this down here is the search functionality itself. It's called aggregate because aggregation is basically this whole, I don't know, this whole feature where you can um, process large data sets in MongoDB. And the original MongoDB syntax is a bit different than what I'm using here because I'm using Mongoose, which is basically another library on top on Mongo of MongoDB, which makes using these different features a bit easier by providing different methods but it's not so much different from the original syntax. And by default, when we pass this search query to Atlas search, it will already search for each word individually. So it, it would search for Android, for beginner and for tutorial, and it would prefer search results where all these words appear in, or two of them, over just one of them, and preferably in the same order. And the better the match is, the higher the search score is that we get back. But by default, it won't find partial matches for these words, which is a problem because beginner 
would not find beginners because there's an S at the end. Similarly, if we have something like um, React, it would not find this one here, React.js, because there is no space in between these words. This is why I'm using this wildcard operator here. With wildcard, we can say, okay, anything after this word and or anything before this word is also a match. And this is what I'm actually doing here. As you can see, I take the query string, I split it up at any space, so we take each word individually, and then I create an array of these single words, for example, yeah, Android, beginner, and tutorial, and then I add this asterisk before and after each word, which are the wildcards. So React, or React will also find React.js, and anything before the word is also a match which is particularly useful because I also want to search in the URL of the resource. And then it should matter if there is more text right before it or after it because the URL yeah, has the HTTPS and everything. And we want to search right in the middle. So if I search for YouTube, for example, it will find all resources where YouTube is in the URL because there could also be something like Android or React in the URL, and I think this is important. So I wanna, wanna search there as well. But here's an important detail. I don't apply these wildcards to words, to words that have less than three characters, because many programming languages just have one letter as the word, for example, Z, or R is also a programming language, and I think they're even more like F and stuff like that. And if I search for Z, I don't want to find any resource that just has the letter Z anywhere because then uh, yeah, we would find almost anything. So this one will not have wildcards applied to it because I don't want to find React, for example, just because there's a Z in the word React. Instead, we only find resources where there's actually a Z as a single letter anywhere in the title or description anywhere. Now it also finds this one here. I think this is because there is a Z in here and it treats this as a single word, probably because of the slashes. I think they have a special meaning in wildcard. Yeah, they have, they actually have. Um, I have to fix this later, but this is not perfect yet. This whole search is not perfect yet, but it doesn't have to be. After it's released, I can keep iterating on it. I can keep improving it, but I think it's already pretty neat. What I also do is I apply different weights to different metadata. As you can see here, this is split, split up in three different parts. We search in the title of the resource, in the link and in the creator name actually as well. So for example, yeah, here it's ABC. And then we search in the topics, which are these tags down here. And the reason this is a separate entry here is because we, we boost the score of matches in these topics, which means that whenever it finds the search query string in these topics down here, it has more impact on the search results. It has more impact on this score, the search score. Why? Because I think the tags are more descriptive. They contain less fluff words. For example, if we have um, Android beginner course, then a word like course is not really important for the search result. Android is more important. And Android is the kind of word that will appear in these tags down here. But the word course will usually not appear down here. This is why I give more weight to these topics. Similarly, I also want to search in a description, but I give this a very low score impact by multiplying it with 0.2 because yeah, these descriptions contain a lot of fluff. So I don't want this to impact the search too much, but I want it to impact it a little bit. For example, if there is a resource on React, then in the description there might be something like, this is better than Vue.js. So if someone searches for Vue.js, it will also find this result because the word appears in the description, but it should have a very low weight because it doesn't necessarily mean that this is what the resource is actually about. Whereas if the word appears in the title or in the text, then of course it's usually what this resource covers. And here I just see that this is not properly uh, responsive yet, but again, I will fix this in the future. Okay, and of course the voting functionality is also very important. And this can be a bit tricky with the results because I don't just wanna order these results by the votes because then this whole search score is basically pointless. But I also want the 
resources with higher votes get to the top. So I don't know yet how to do this properly. What I uh, do right now is whenever there is an upvote, I uh, add plus 0.1 to the search score. So it moves a little bit higher. So when I vote this up and refresh the page, it will have a, a value of 3.3. And similarly, this will lead to uh, 3.1 and it moves below this one here. I don't know yet if this is the right way to go about this, but right now it's the best idea I have. And these votes are stored in MongoDB as well, but in their very own collection. Now one idea might be to just store these votes in an array of each resource, because yeah, the votes belong to the resource, right? But this would cause some problems. One problem is that there can be a lot of votes and the nested array in the resource could grow very big. But also, I don't only want to be able to quickly find all votes for a specific resource. I also want to find all votes done by a specific user. And if the votes are a nested array in each resource, then this other query for the votes of each user would be very difficult because we have to go through each resource through each array, search for the user ID, I think this would be very slow and unperformant. Instead, when you have these many-to-many -many relationships where every user can vote on every resource, then you usually want to put this into a separate collection. And yeah, this is what I've done here. So each resource is simply a single document in this resource words collection that contains the ID of the user that has voted, the ID of the resource that this user has voted, and then the string for up and down if it was an up or a down vote. And again, MongoDB is very efficient in looking up these votes. And I actually do this in the same aggregate call where the search is happening. Down here we have this lookup operator, which is basically a, a join command in SQL. And as you can see, the syntax is pretty simple. We tell it from what um, collection we want to find the documents, the resource words. Then we tell it what field in the resource has to match to which field in the resource word document. So when we look up our resources, we want to find all votes that belong to the ID of this particular resource. So the ID value of the resource has to match to the resource ID value of the resource vote. Again, this is pretty similar to how it works in SQL. And then we tell it that it has to put this into a votes field in each resource. So then we can just say here resource.votes. And this is where all our votes documents for this particular resource are in. And this is very efficient. As you can see, when we refresh this, it's super fast. The search is so fast and it does this while looking up this other collection in the same process. Yeah, with this operator here, we are appending the search score to each document because by default this is hidden. Now the search score still orders these results automatically, but we don't have to uh, retrieve this value if we don't need it. But I actually want to retrieve it for one because I want to display it for debugging purposes, but also because what I do down here is this ordering for the votes, where I check how many upvotes, how many downvotes, and then I uh, boost the search score manually by 0.1. Now there's actually a way to also do this up here, which would be even more efficient. And someone on Stack Overflow told me how to do this. I just haven't implemented it yet. But yeah, this will basically move up here into the aggregate call. Yeah, and some other stuff we have here is for example, this facet call. With facet, we split up a search query in two different parts. Why do we need this? Because we need the results with our filters applied, the match filters. The match filters are these different checkboxes that we have here. For example, when I click um, advanced, it will only show the advanced tutorials. So why do we need this facet call? This is really interesting because I want to display all languages as options down here, but only the languages that actually appear in the search results. For, so you can see here English, Averic, whatever this is, and English again. So those are options over here. I don't want to show every single language. If I search for Android React, for example, which will find results for both Android and React, we have another option here, Danish, which we can filter as well. 
Now the problem is we don't want the languages after the match filters are applied because otherwise if I would click Danish here then there would only be the language Danish in, this Danish in the search results which means that Arabic and English would disappear from the options down here. But this would be very awkward, this is not what we want. Instead I always want to see all languages for the search query before the match filters are applied. This is why we have to split this up with this facet call. So we get one branch with the match filters applied and we get this other branch without the match filters applied and then we use these other operators here which basically create a, a Z with the different languages. So each language only appears one time in the set and then I show this in the UI. You don't have to understand this in detail, I just think this is interesting. And it's interesting to see that Mongo can do all these different things and you can create these really uh, advanced search features. And now I want to take a moment and thank today's sponsor Brilliant. If you want to learn how these search algorithms work and improve your knowledge about data structures and algorithms, I highly recommend that you check them out. Brilliant has many courses on computer science topics and one of them actually covers search engines in detail and explains how it is possible that Google can search the whole web in a matter of milliseconds. They teach you in detail how all of this works under the hood with indexes and web crawlers and everything. They have beginner courses that will teach you the basics of computer science, like how different algorithms and data structures work, as well as more advanced topics like neural networks, quantum computing and cryptocurrency. Every course on Brilliant is split up into bite-sized interactive lessons with little games and quizzes. This really helps you cement the knowledge and it's also much more fun than just reading a boring textbook. I think Brilliant is a great resource for everyone who is searching for a programming job or just wants to improve their computer science knowledge. Try out Brilliant for free by clicking the link in the description or visit brilliant.org slash coding in flow. And as a special offer, the first 200 people who sign up through my link get a 20% discount on an annual membership. And as you can also see, every filter we apply also appears in the URL up here. So we have um, the base URL slash resources, then a question mark which indicates that uh, the URL parameters start. You know this from um, REST APIs already. Q equals is the search query and language equals DA, which is the, the short code for Danish. If I select English as well, then it appears in the query parameter tour and the same for all these other filters here. Type equals paid. Now actually I wouldn't have to put these query parameters into the URL. I could just store these values in variables and then make the request on the server and the URL could just stay um, base URL slash resources or whatever I want. I put these parameters into the URL on purpose because I want these URLs to be shareable. If someone copies this URL and types it in the search bar, I want this exact search to appear again because I think this makes the website more useful. So I put these there on purpose and the URL is also the single source of truth for the search parameters. I don't keep these values in any other variable because I want to make sure that whatever we type into the address bar will perfectly ref uh, reflect the search that is applied on the website. So the query parameters are the single source of truth for the search parameters, for the search filters. And in React, we can uh, make modifications to uh, the URL query very easily with this use search params hook. And yeah, when we make the request on the server, we send these search params directly. Again, it's not, they are not stored in any other variable. And when we update our filters, then these modifications are done directly on the search params as well. Yeah, and on the node server, we uh, then get these parameters over this query field here, which is a feature of node and express. So whatever we uh, pass via URL search parameters will be contained in this query field. And if there are multiple params with the same name, for example, type equals paid and type equals free no rec, which means free, no registration required, then we will receive these values as an array and then we can just um, use this array to search for both values. And the way submitting a resource works is that we have the submit resource button. If we are logged in, it will bring us to this form here. If we are logged out, 
it will bring us to the sign up screen first because yeah only users who are logged in should be able to submit a resource to avoid spam so here we can either create an account or click on login here we can type in the email or the username it will automatically uh, figure out if it's uh, if it's one of or the other and the way i do this is i simply don't allow ad signs in the username and twitter is doing the same actually so this is where i took this from so then later on the server i just have to look is there an ad sign in the name or not if there's one in that's then it's an email if not then it's a username type in the password of course we can unhide it and so on log in click all this stuff here away and then we can submit a resource i already talked about this dialogue a little bit in the last part of the engage a lot vlog because there i talked about two tab a little bit as a short summary i'm using a library called formic and a library called yup or yup to uh, do the validation in this form for example if we uh, type something in here but it's not a valid url and we click on another field or outside then it immediately shows this warning here if we type in a real looking url and click outside or well, actually immediately the warning disappears this is actually not as easy as it seems and the library formic makes this a little bit easier similarly these other fields are also have validation so if i click submit it will show everything in red that we have to fill out so these fields here are mandatory down here we have some optional fields again i talked about this in the last engage a lot video so yeah we can submit these resources but before they are visible on the website they have to be approved first so uh, when we create a new resource approved is set to false first and me or later maybe uh, some uh, people who uh, help with this website then have to uh, check them and approve them again to avoid spam we can also bookmark resources already and this one is stored in an array in each user document here we don't have this many to many relationship we have a one to many relationship and i think no user will have a couple billions of resources bookmarked at the same time so it's fine to store this in an array so here are just the ideas of the resources that we have bookmarked and later in the profile page or in the back end of the user we can just quickly look up these resources and they then display them there as bookmarks and we can also edit existing resources because the idea is that we uh, want to keep this list as high quality as possible so users should be able to make improvements to resources and similarly to uh, how the submitting user is displayed here in the metadata there is also another field for the last user that updated the resource just to give them some recognition for their work so we can type edit we have this um, confirmation dialog first edit this resource and what i simply do is I pre-populate the same submit resource form just with the already existing data and then you can make changes to it and submit it if you want. And again these update requests are actually stored in yet another collection, this one here, resource update requests. Now the first idea might be to just do a patch request on the resources endpoint. But again, I want to have to approve these resource updates before I display the changes on the website. This is why they are a completely different kind of uh, collection in the database. Whenever you send an update request, there will be another entry here, which contains the new data and the ID of the resource that you want to change. And then someone has to check them and approve them first before they will be applied. Uh, that's the idea. Again, this is all not perfect yet but it doesn't have to be i just want to have a starting point and then reiterate from there also that's one thing that's not working properly yet is that the, the number here will always show the results for the query before the filters are applied so as you can see it's still showing five even though uh, we only have one for paid resources that's something i still have to figure out how to fix this but yeah it's all not a big deal and I learned this simply by looking at the documentation of MongoDB and Mongo Atlas, and there are a lot of questions on Stack Overflow that cover a lot of these things here in detail. 
Oh, and of course, I need pagination. I haven't implemented this yet either. So if we uh, have, I don't know, a thousand results here, then of course we don't want to load them all at once. Instead, we want to show them in batches, like 10 per page or something like that. I also want to implement some kind of fussy search, which means that it will match even if there's a typo in it. So if someone types in uh, Android, for example, I think, yeah, right now it doesn't find Android, but of course it should. It is something I still have to implement. I want to implement an autocomplete functionality for the search bar here. Right now it only shows the queries I typed in myself, but I also want to show queries that are popular on the search over all the users. One thing I also want to implement are synonyms, maybe. So for example, if someone searches for JS, I think it should also find JavaScript, right? Right now it doesn't. It only finds if the two letters JS actually appear in here. You can also do this with MongoDB just by providing synonyms for certain words. Yeah, that's something that's cool. I want to implement comments where user can write comments on a resource. I want to implement a whole community, a forum, but this is still far in the future. The first version I will release will not have the community features yet. But you can already do a lot of cool stuff. You can route resources, um, you can filter them, you can search them. Really nice. So after I've implemented pagination and some other important stuff, then the beta version will be out very soon. And again, you can go to tutab.io and join the waiting list and I will notify you when the beta version is ready and also I will take my first users incrementally from this list so I will start with probably 10 users then 20, 50, 100 and so on just to make sure that it doesn't everything fall apart uh, when there are too many users and make sure that there are no really bad bugs in there. And one more thing, the website doesn't have a logo yet so if one of you has design skills and wants to make a logo of course would be very nice. I would give you a shout out in the next video for that. Otherwise, I will just hire a professional designer later, but not right now. I want to wait a little bit before I uh, pay money for this. I just want to make sure that the site is actually useful and I don't abandon the project in, a, in two weeks. If you want to make a logo, then uh, it would be very cool if you use the colors of the website, which right now are this gold color here and this bluish color for the background. And the hex codes are this one here for the golden one and this is the background color so you can use them if you want to make a logo if one of you has design skills and is a bit bored i don't know how this logo could look maybe uh, maybe in the style of these search results maybe like three golden rectangles below each other very simple maybe this would look cool i don't know i'm not a designer this is just an idea i have in my mind yeah, that's it for the update about this project for now. Again, uh, join the waiting list if you want to be uh, under the first people who can use this tool. And I will keep you updated with more videos about this on this channel. And I hope I see you in the next one. Happy coding. Take care.